What's up, NHL fans? It is a beautiful Tuesday here on the East Coast. This is your morning cup of hockey alongside Kobe Cohen. I'm Johnny Lazarus, and we are presented by Betway. If you're going to place a bet, bet on Betway. Please play responsibly, and remember, you must be 19 years of age or older. We're going to be joined by Frank Valley, NHL insider, here shortly in the next five minutes or so, and then we'll talk about Everything that's gone on around the NHL, the Arizona Coyotes are making news yet again, and we will welcome on Bobby Robbins, the former Boston Bruins enforcer, at around 9.30 to wrap up the show. We'll get a lot of his fighting stories, and we'll hear about his new book called Sex, Drugs, Pucks, and Souls, The Secret Life of a Hockey Fighter. So we got a lot to get into today, but before we do any of that, Colby, I actually want to just talk non-hockey for a quick second because we were just talking about it a little bit before the show. I had a perfect Final Four in my March Madness bracket, and I only took home $165. Is that not the biggest waste of entering March Madness ever? That is the biggest Johnny <laughs> Lazarus story I've ever heard. Ever. <laughs> I mean, it totally it totally checks out. You know, only you would have like a million dollar bracket and only win $160 for it. So um, it checks out. Let's just say that. But also, like, how... How the hell did you do that? I mean, like, that's like ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's not uh, like I, it was chalk. It's not like it was four one seeds. No, um, I don't really watch a lot of college basketball. One of my roommates is a big Providence Friars basketball fan. He's from Rhode Island. And like he gave me some tips. I listened to part of my take with John Rothstein. And I just kind of threw together, you know, for not random. Like UConn and, and Purdue, I feel like were pretty easy picks. But Alabama was pretty random. And then NC State was like a team that went on a crazy run and won the ACC tournament. And they just said, like, there's always one wild card team. You may as well throw in them. So uh, I got pretty lucky. But, you know, I didn't do the 300 person pool. I did the, you know, 20 person pool. Should have done the one uh, on ESPN. You, you, I, know. I mean, that, that one you could have won a bunch of money on too. I don't I even, honestly, I don't even fill out a bracket. It's just not, uh, I just don't I don't follow college basketball. Like when Villanova's not good, I really don't follow college basketball. I, I grew up watching a little bit of Villanova basketball because of Jay Wright, you know, the, the former yeah, head coach. The coach. Um, I used to play little league like against his kids, so um, or my younger brother. It's it was like always around the little league field. It's really good guys. So, anyways, um I'm looking forward to getting Frank on here this morning. Mm -hmm. And and it's funny, like I was trying to I was texting with him a little bit last night when the Arizona Coyotes stuff started coming out. Um, mm -hmm. he, he went with his family to WWE or WWE. I guess w, WWE has been like at the Lincoln Financial Field last night. He was right? at the link for two days, and yeah. then and then it last night it, they had their their Monday night show at um, at the Wells Fargo Center in Philly. So Frank took his kids last night, so I never got a chance to you know, talk to him about this whole Arizona thing. But I did think it was really funny that when he, he tweeted something in regards to the Arizona situation, like a week or two ago, and a bunch of Arizona based reporters, like jumped down his neck and basically said, he didn't know what he was talking about. Um, and then lo and behold, that report comes out yesterday where, you know, they're like, we're going to do everything we can to make sure that this doesn't happen, which is not, you know, that's not a good sign. When, when you're, you know, fighting that uphill, well documented um, to have to have that go on. So I, I it's kind of perfect that he's coming on today because the last couple of weeks we haven't really had news like that to get into. Uh -huh. um, but I'm I'm looking forward to it today. I'm actually going to send him a text right now and ask him when he's uh, when he's coming on. I would pay good money to see Frank Saravelli as a fan at a WWE match. That'd be hilarious content. I feel yeah, like he, he, what? He, he's going for his kids. No, I he, know, but I feel like he'd get into it. Like, you know what I mean? Like he, take, he, he takes his kids to do everything. He, he yeah. is. Um, I mean, you know, we don't live very far from each other in the summer. I mean, we don't mm -hmm. live far from each other in general. We're about 35, maybe minutes apart from one another. Um, but in the summer, we're like 10 minutes apart down the, down at the beach. And he's a, he, man, I always say in my next life, I want to come back as his kids because mm -hmm. his kids, uh, his kids have it really good. Um, they, they do, they have it really good. All the different things that, that they get to do. So 
I got a question in the chat from Chef Richard. He said, are you sporting a salmon shirt today? This is actually our new sponsor, Out West, that we uh, talked about a little bit on Thursday. We're going to do our Out West Worst Team of the Week every Thursday. But, yes, this is a salmon shirt. Kobe refuses to wear it. says it's a bad color on him. Um, and we got another question from our guy, Pizza Sports Guy, asked if I'll be at UBS Arena tonight. I will be. Big Ranger Islander game tonight um, at UBS. So questions coming in in the chat already. Got to chirp Jeremiah for that Vegas money line pick last night. They can't hold on to leads. Jeremiah, I think we're 0 for 2 now uh, using your bets. So I don't know. He might get cut. Um, but Colby, is Frank here? No, he's going to be here in a couple of minutes. Here's what I think we're going to do today. I think we're going to reverse things a little bit and do a little preview of tonight um, and tonight's games while we wait for Frank. He's just running a little bit behind schedule. Um, mm -hmm. Big slate of games tonight in the NHL. And it, it really is remarkable how a, a month and a half ago, we're like, we got to shorten the season. We got to expand the playoffs. You know, the, the, the races aren't really working out. And now... We're a week out here, and there's still so much that needs to be settled. And you look at the 13 games tonight, starting with Washington and Pittsburgh, okay? Excuse me, Washington and Detroit. Like, that's a do-or-die uh, get-in or 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 not for these two teams. And it's happening at game 70, what, 8, 70, something like mm -hmm. that, 77 or 78 for these teams. I mean, the slate tonight, um, you've got games like that, You've got potential first round matchups with Islanders Rangers. I mean, that looks like it very much could happen, right? Um, mm -hmm. You've got Carolina Boston, which could be another first round matchup tonight. So it's kind of a loaded slate tonight for different team, you know, different reasons for different teams. Maybe some some tone setting opportunities and also some, you know, basically one game elimination types of games for some of these other teams. Yeah, another game, too. I mean, Philly versus Montreal was not a game to sleep on, too. I feel like Philly has been a little bit forgotten about now that they've gone on their skid here. But As they Montreal, should be. They're done. Yeah. They're done. But, like, are they? So why are you saying that that game shouldn't be forgot about? What, like, what? Because every time why? that we... Every time that we've written a team off, they've found a way to get themselves back in. How many times have yeah. we said the Islanders were done? Yeah, but that... I mean, come on. that The Flyers we, are it, done. It just happens because no one takes over. Thinking they're going to win when the Islanders have, have gotten on a little bit of a streak right now. Yeah, it's but the Rangers, the, Rangers points could last easily, night. the Rangers could easily beat the Islanders in regulation tonight and Philly could win and then get right back in the mix. That's just how yeah, it's going. I don't, I, I, don't, I don't foresee it happening. I think the Flyers are done. I think that, uh, I think that the, the, the ship has sailed on that team. I mean, I heard Tortorella talking yesterday or, or the day before. Um, he, he was you know, talking about the fact that, you know, their goaltending hasn't been good enough. They made, he said, I made a decision to go with Sammy. We only thought he'd play 18 games this year. He said they did know that this was going to happen with Carter Hart, though. At some point, it felt like he maybe was taking a little bit of a shot. I don't know, up at, at, at management for not doing something in goal. Um, he kind of fell on the sword for Fedotov and's like, Look, we threw this guy into a really bad situation. We don't know even where he's been the last couple of years, which is true. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, the guy was on his military service for a year. There's a reason that they let him go in Russia to come here because they probably didn't like the way he was playing. That's kind of how they operate. So I think there's way bigger games tonight than Philly Montreal. That's not the game I'm going to have my eyes on at all uh, tonight. Well, of course, of course, that's not the game to watch, but I, I just meant it in the fact that if the Islanders, lose and philly wins philly gets right back in that spot and same thing with detroit uh well would they jump washington i think they would depends i guess no they both have the same amount of regulation wins that's a, that's a tiebreaker to look out for uh with philly and washington um but washington does have a game in hand so i don't know there's so many games to watch from tonight like it is it is unbelievable this week um detroit is a team to keep your eye on because they play like you said, the Caps tonight and Pittsburgh Thursday. Do you want to talk about that game a little bit last night, that Penguins versus Toronto game? Um, you know, what what a game that was, what a finish that was. Austin Matthews scored 65. Uh, but before we do that, let me just talk do about he, do you think what? do you think he's gonna get to 70? I do. I do. You do think he'll get to 70? Yeah, I do. I do. But before we talk about that, let's just talk about our sponsor, the Parasso playoff preview, presented by Parasso, the most complete choice for shaving and beard care. 
Made in Italy since 1948, Parasso has been a staple of Italian culture and barbershops globally for four generations. So get 15% off at Parasso-USA.com with our promo code HOCKEY15 in all caps. HOCKEY15 at Parasso-USA.com. A great finish to that game last night. Sidney Crosby let one of the linesmen absolutely fucking have it. Imagine Sidney Crosby skating up to you and saying, you fucked up, buddy. Like that is, that is something I feel like you can't come back from. But that overtime goal specifically, Jake McCabe scores the game winner. Matthews makes a sick one-handed saucer pass. And Marner, I, I thought this could have been called because Bertuzzi's still like hanging over the bench. Bertuzzi hopped on. Marner stayed on. Didn't play the puck as it was coming to him because it would have been too many men penalty. But Bertuzzi's sitting with his legs over the boards. He hops on with like maybe a second to spare before Marner plays it, and then it turns into the game-winning goal. Did you think it was questionable at all, or this is a fine play to you? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's definitely questionable, but I, I do think that they had that as a sort of a point of emphasis this year. But In the meetings, it right? It doesn't affect. It doesn't affect the play. Like, mm-hmm. how does it affect the play? And so, I think common sense needs to set in on a play like that. And, and I don't think it's the wrong call or the wrong decision because um, I, I just think that that, you know, smart play. I mean, like heads really up hockey play. plays there. And, and like the one handed, look how he wait. I mean, look, I have no problem with it. I really don't. I have no problem with it. Um, the play that Matthews made the one hand play. Let's just, I just want to like put that on a pedestal for a minute because mm-hmm. that's, that's the kind of play you should be texting me about. Like, yeah. oh my God, did you see that play? Not a little give and go at the blue line. That's like a everyday play for an NHL player. Like that is insane right there. Just to have the strength to do that with your top hand, uh, to get that out there. I mean, that that creates the whole goal because that pass was actually so slow that it starts dragging the coverage out high. Mm-hmm. And McCabe makes a really smart heads up play to jump around him and jump in the back there and bury that goal. So um, I'm laughing at some of the comments in the chat. Recon Gamer said, "Asked if you're going to wear your Islanders jersey to MSG or to, yeah, he, to Long Island tonight." And then I saw one other, I saw one other comment about the Leafs' 70 goals for Matthews just to get knocked out in the first round. Hey, Recon I Gamer not, again. <laughs> listen, I don't like the Leafs' chances in the first round, whether they play Florida or Boston. Like, I don't see the Leafs getting out. I would think. <clears throat> Boston is a better matchup for them. Like I know Boston has that sort of big brother, I'm your daddy thing with, with Toronto, but I'm just telling you right now (laughs) on paper, if I'm a player, I'd rather see Boston than Florida in the first round. And I know Florida hasn't played great as of late, but their depth and, and, and them down the middle is a hell of a lot scarier than the Boston Bruins down the middle. And we see year after year teams that can dominate, down the middle and on the back end usually are able to get through into deep playoff runs. So um, it is, it is a funny comment though, seeing people, they love to hate the Leafs. They really do. Other than our producer and people who live in Toronto, everybody else just loves to hate the Leafs. But even the Leafs fans also love to hate the Leafs, but uh, Frank Sarah Valley is waiting. So let's welcome in Frank fresh off WWE. How'd it go last night, Frankie? How was the wrestling match? <laughs> I don't. I'm not. A, I don't watch wrestling, so I don't know what the the common term or phrase would be. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was something. I've mm-hmm. never been to wrestling before, and uh, I'd say an interesting cross section of humanity. A lot of people walking around with uh, title belts on, and. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I'm a little was... disappointed that you didn't text me because I would have came. I would have I would have come with you had I known like the rock would be in the house and stuff like that. Like the little kid in me would have 100% got a ticket and came with you and, and the fam last night. So I'm, I'm a little disappointed that you didn't tell me you were there until you were there. You're usually pretty good about that with me. Maybe you just didn't want to hang out with you. Yeah. No, so I, <laughs> I took my two kids and I took my buddy who's a lifelong wrestling fan. Like this guy, okay. he flies around to WrestleMania every year. And he was supposed to go on a trip to Florida, so he didn't buy tickets last night for the Raw portion. And uh, so I invited him, and he was overjoyed. And uh, it was, yeah, I mean, it was interesting. I mean, he's one of those guys that, like, 
every time someone says something into the microphone, he's like yelling something back at them. So it was, <laughs> it was really kind of, it was something, but Johnny, where are you? looks like you're doing this from a neighborhood preschool. Yeah. I'm at my sister's house right now. Um, <laughs> is she a preschool I'm, teacher? She actually is an elementary school teacher. Uh, wow. Look at that. Oh, it's so organized. You can yeah. tell like you're, you're like well, one drawer away from the finger painting. She has people she has in the chat mic. are asking why somebody, I think I saw, Somebody said in the chat, why is it Johnny in an art class right now? Yeah, Let's yeah. I met my sister for the next like two days. Uh, have some like, you know, dentist appointments and accountant meetings on Long Island. Um, Miss Lippy's so. car is green. Miss Lippy's car is green. It's, you know, it's funny, actually. Uh, you know, I, I had the dog scratching on the door before. My sister's baby is right outside. Um, so a little family just friendly. A, just a little sign of things to come, Johnny. Nope. That is that is not uh, not happening. And Colby also actually confirmed this morning that if I do get married someday, not only will he not make a speech, but he won't even show up. So, um, Frank, yeah, I might we all know there. that's a lie. Frank, can you can you announce? Can you leak my engagement at a, at a future date? Don't you need to meet a girl before you have an engagement? All right. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? All right. So uh, look, yeah, yeah. Let's let's, let's talk about this. We got Bobby <laughs> Robbins coming on in 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 like ten minutes. We're not keeping Frank very long today, but Frank. I, I really need to ask you about this. And and I told everyone I was trying to call you about it all day yesterday because I was laughing so hard. Um, and I it, it's the, the, the Arizona Coyotes. I mean, I, I got I, I laughed. Be, here's why I laughed. I laughed because like a week ago <clears throat> you tweeted something like, look, I'm just going to point facts out here. This is a long ways from being done. OK, you, everybody's like celebrating renderings, but there's a lot of obstacles to clear. And then the Arizona media or or some media folks in Arizona jumped down your throat and they said, like, you have no idea what you're talking about. You're not local. I mean, like there was one woman in particular. I can't remember what her name was. Um, and she was all over you. And I was just thinking to myself. Something tells me Frank's going to have the last word on this. And then that article drops yesterday, Frank. Look, it's it's not about me or the last word or what I think. I just try and tell people what I know. And I actually, this is the God's honest truth. I, I feel bad for Coyotes fans. Look, you know when you go to a rink or you go to a wrestling match or wherever you go, you always hear... Oh, these are the best fans in the world. Think about the absolute shit sandwich that for the last two decades, Coyotes fans have had to eat. No chance at winning. Your team moves from munis municipality to municipality. No long-term home or future, at least right now. And yet you're still a fan like that to me is the true definition of a fan. And so mm -hmm. I have a ton of respect for coyotes fans and there anything that I report or say just FYI is not, I'm not a coyotes hater. I don't care where they play. I'll be abundantly honest. Uh, they could play on Mars. It doesn't matter to me. I actually am a believer in the Phoenix market. And I think that with actual good ownership and a new arena, and a team the way that Bill Armstrong is building it, I think it could actually be really successful. Yeah. So I'm not rooting against anyone. My point in mentioning all of this is, A, it feels like no one else is really doing it, and B, this is what's actually happening behind the scenes. So there's a lot to unpack. The fact that the Coyotes put out all these strong press releases prior to the Tempe vote and the renderings and everything else. We're a long way from getting to June 27th with an actual auction date. And my belief, at least as I currently know it and hear right now, if the Coyotes ownership is still involved in making a land auction bid at that time, that I believe that there's a better likelihood that it'll be for an expansion Coyotes team in the future and not this current one, because I think there's a real chance that they'll be relocated before we even get to June. I mean, I, I and hold on. Well, Frank, can I just ask you a question? What, like, 
Why is that? Like, where is the breakdown between like what the coyotes are telling us publicly, what the city in Scottsdale or, or, or in, in Phoenix and like the municipalities, like obviously there's a lot of layers, what Gary Bettman is saying behind the scenes, the guy in Utah's tweeting, what, That's what I was going to say, like, like, yeah, like, can you just try to, why is the okay. question? Like why, you know, I, I, there's I, a lot to unpack there. So like, yeah. I'll, I'll help you. Um, Help One is you. both in the league office and also in Arizona locally. There aren't many people outside of the Coyotes front office that have faith that owner Alex Maruello can actually get this done. So again, just bigger picture here. It's one thing to win the land on June 27th, which they could do. All you have to do is write the biggest check. We don't know if there's going to be any other bidders or not, but even if there aren't, you, okay, so you write the check. Okay, that's one thing. To get from check to shovels and steel in the ground, and as the mayor of Scottsdale pointed out yesterday, infrastructure, water, sewer, roads, traffic, a million electric, all these right. things that need to go with it, gas, um, that all then needs to happen next. You need to clear all of the legal hurdles if anyone places any challenges against you in court. So in a best case scenario, what we're looking at, if everything goes perfectly, is that shovels will be in the ground at some point in 2025. And then it's going to take a couple years beyond that because the weather's pretty good in Arizona that the best ideal scenario is that the Arizona Coyotes are playing in a new arena in North Scottsdale, I guess is what you would call it, or North Phoenix bordering on Scottsdale in October of 2027 for the 2027-28 season. And that's if there are zero hiccups. So that's one part of it. So park that to the side. Then the next part of it is the Ryan Smith group in Salt Lake city, a billionaire who desperately apparently wants to be part of the NHL club. He sends out that tweet yesterday saying we're soliciting names. What do you think this franchise should be called? If we were to get one now, we know that in the NHL, you have to kiss the ring. You have to get down on one knee to Gary Bettman. If you want to be part of his club. And what that means is he controls the whole process. And so if you step out of line and if you get on the bad list, as others can attest to, including Jim Balsilli, you're not going to get a team. And to think that Ryan Smith didn't at least make the NHL aware of his intentions to put out this survey yesterday, that's, that's insane. Of course they're aware. And so then your next question that you need to ask yourself is, why is he doing it on April 8th? If you're getting an expansion franchise, it's not going to be for the fall. So why would you need to do it today? Well, the reason right. is they're prepping just like the NHL is prepping. And I'd be shocked if the NHL is not drafting two versions of schedules, one with the Coyotes in Arizona and another one with the Coyotes with whatever name they're going to have playing in Salt Lake City simultaneously for next season. Didn't so, Bill Daly recently say, though, that they wouldn't be able to move for next year regardless if they relocated? Or nope. It, he said in June it would be too late, which okay. is why I keep telling everyone, and this guy that tweeted at me from the Phoenix show yesterday, PHNX, we'll see on June 27th if Frank is right or wrong. And I said, bud, we might know way before then. Ooh. If we get to June 1st, then the Coyotes probably most likely are playing in Mullet Arena next season. That was a but I'm ball. telling you that there is a much greater chance than zero that they don't even make it that far. And so then here's the third part of it, which is, so why would the Coyotes send out this statement and the renderings? Mm -hmm. It's because their owner, I believe one of the options on the table is to sell the franchise back to the NHL, then have the NHL sell the franchise to Ryan Smith and collect the middle ground of that transaction, which is a relocation fee and sprinkle that between the owners. And then what Alex Maruello from the coyotes goes and does is he has a promise from the NHL that 
if you deliver on all these things that we want, including getting this new arena built finally, we will come back to Arizona in 27-28 with a new expansion franchise for you to run. This is just chaotic. <laughs> so there's yeah. a lot to it, yeah. but why? So your original question was, why aren't the Coyotes saying more? Why isn't the NHL saying more? Because all of this is happening behind the scenes. No one yeah. knows yet exactly which way it's going to go. I think a lot of people have plans on what they, how they'd like it to happen, but it's still too early to say. And so no one's saying anything publicly except for me telling you what's happening behind the scenes. So this is quote unquote, Frank, the coyote hater, just telling you what's really happening. Is there any possibility of them? You know, you said the 27, 28 season is if everything goes correctly, right? Would they possibly play in mold arena till then? In any They wouldn't case have scenario? a choice in really? any case scenario. I, that, I that could mean, be that could happen. Yeah, it could happen. They they originally contemplated a three year lease at Mullet Arena with two additional one year options for a total of five years. So that lines up. It's possible for sure. Mm -hmm. I think a big question from a business case and Colby, you're you know you've got other businesses like you'd understand this. You have forty six hundred seat arena right now and a small season ticket base of 3,500. How do you go from 3,500 season tickets to like 13,000 in the next building, plus regular walk-up game day sales? You trade it's for a, Austin No Matthew. matter what, it's going to be a big ask and a big well, undertaking to have that team be successful. A new arena, perfect location or not. And the, the other thing, too, that is just really... I, that really stuck out to me in that statement from the from the Scottsdale people was they called him a rookie land developer and and let me tell you something I, I, I've as Frank just noted I've built a couple of you know not personally but been on the project to build a, a, a number of skating rinks in this area um, albeit outdoor rinks but still you know and when when you start meeting with townships and you start getting into um, water runoff and sewer and electricity that has to get put under the ground and the amount that goes into developing and the zoning and then you have a meeting and then a meeting has a meeting and then that meeting has a meeting <laughs> and then there's a vote. It's insane. And and, and that's fact, for a hundred by right. hundred little rink. That's We're talking about with, 95 if, acres of development with, with, with thousands of cars in and out that's and what, I, whatever other uses. is that you have to know what you're doing to execute what the coyotes are planning. And when you see that whole entertainment district, like to me, like they're probably scared shitless because the coyotes wouldn't even pay their tax bill at their last arena. And now they have this, these people that want to want to become land mavens and put an entire district together. I think the towns are probably worried about the finances. They're probably worried the money will run out. They're probably worried the bills won't get paid. Like all because fair the questions. His the history has said such. Yeah. And look, I'm the hater though. You're the hater. I mean, just because we tell you what reality is, we're the haters. Yeah, I mean, I'm just I'm just saying it like it is. I, I'm I love Scottsdale and Tempe. They're great places. They're so much fun. There's good weather. There's nice hiking, you know, on Camelback. I'm Let's with you, Frank. I'd love to see it work. I would love to see it work there, but it's it's proven inept uh, until now. It's it's proven to which be is, inept. Which is why I took you back to the first point that I made before anything else happened, which is both the NHL and a lot of people on the ground in Arizona don't have a lot of faith that Alex Maruello can pull this off. It's great to have plans. It's another thing to actually go and execute. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, you know, from someone who doesn't know so much about the situation, but as a hockey fan, I think everyone just wants to see this get done, have an answer, whether they're staying or whether they're leaving. I, I think this conversation has just been dragged on for so long. And at some point, when do we just cut the cord and say this has gone on far too long? Like, well, it's, it's embarrassing. I think that's another really fair point to make is I think the overall health of the franchise has, has really suffered because yeah. it's a toxic brand. Regardless of whatever you say, there's a reason why Ryan Smith is putting out a survey for a new name. Mm -hmm. Guess what? The Utah Jazz, Utah already got a team in the Utah Jazz that took a franchise name 
from New Orleans where it made sense and just kept the name. There's no chance you could do that here because they're <laughs> just they're a laughing stock. Yeah. And it's it's through two decades of mismanagement, poor ownership, bankruptcy receivership, uh losing. I mean, there's all sorts of things that are attached to it that the coyotes aren't a viable brand name wise, I don't think. I agree in Arizona. Mm -hmm. I totally agree. All right. Well, look, yeah, Frank, you, Frank. we, we, th this was honestly like this lined up so perfectly. Cause I, I really, it, it's great to have you break it down. We're going to have to clip some of that and get it on social media later, just so people can hear a good explanation. But, um, uh, thanks for coming on today, Frank. Uh, it was a, it was a short one. Um, I, I'll be with you all next week on your show. I don't know if, if word has made it to you yet, so we'll be all partnered <laughs> up next week, but, uh, thanks for, that. Th thanks for coming. Thanks for coming on today, Frank. Johnny, enjoy your finger painting. Thanks. <laughs> All right. That was awesome. That's I mean, it's bizarre. It's so bizarre. What? Just the whole coyotes thing. Yeah. Like, it's like enough. I, I'm like, that's what I'm saying. Make, I don't even want to make fun of them about anymore. About enough it. is a fucking enough, right? Yeah. I mean, like, it's, it's, Utah will figure it out. And there's, there's mountains in Utah. So they can come up with Utah Bears, Utah Kodiaks. I saw yet. They'll come up with something good. Yeah. So I actually had nothing. I couldn't think of anything. You in, in will. You're, you're name. creative. You'll do some arts and crafts, mind you. All right. Yeah. Let's bring our sure next so guest on the show today, Bobby Robbins, who, who, um, I'm excited to have you on today, Bobby. We were talking a little bit about you earlier. Um, man, I mean, I'm going to give you a quick introduction and then I'm going to give you the floor here. But um, th this is a guy that I played with in, in the American Hockey League. And, uh, you know, when, when you talk about making an impact on a team coming in, you know, mid season or partial season, I mean, you're, you're looking at the guy right here. I mean, this is one of the, the toughest, uh, scariest, but also nicest people that I ever played hockey with. And, um, his story is, is incredible the way he, he really started at the bottom and worked his way up to the NHL and an NHL contract. And, and, you know, you, you've been through, you know, hell and back almost, and, and, you know, it's good to see your face, man. And I can't wait to hear about your book, but how, how are you, buddy? Like, how are things? What's going on guys? It's been far too long, Col Colby, man. We had some, we had some battles out there. Toughest guys in the American Hockey League, I guess. <laughs> me and you on the P Bruins. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, we had some we had some great times, and oh man, it's it's awesome to see you guys on this show, and uh, to see guys having success now uh, post hockey is really cool to see and inspiring, and uh, something I want to aspire to. So um, blessed to be here, and excited to talk about whatever you guys want to talk about, especially the book. Got the Savage Memoir coming out soon. I actually got a few excerpts I want to read to you guys if you guys don't mind. Yeah, uh, but yeah, we can uh, we can get into that, and uh, it's just good to be here, guys. Well, Bobby, quickly, I just want to bring up the fact you, you mentioned Kobe was a tough player. He acts like the tough guy on this show. Can you actually <laughs> back it up that he was tough on the ice? Because it's hard to find those highlights on YouTube. You guys played so long ago. <laughs> it's this. It looks like it's from the seventies when you look at those <laughs> uh, those YouTube clips. But yeah, you know, Cohen, uh, he combined Cohen. just just skill skill and grit you know it was uh, it was inspiring to see <laughs> no he was a uh, he was a great player i mean a good uh, good solid d-man silky out there um but you know we, we make fun of him a little bit but he was he played hard and rugged and tough and uh, a little backstory of why i kind of tease him as one of the toughest guys in the american hockey league <laughs> he had a, a legendary fight with uh the the toughest guy in the american hockey league brett gallant and uh, when I got called up here to Providence, I think it must have been like day one or two, uh, Colby came up to me and he let me know. He said, you know, I, I did fight uh, Brett Gallant up there and <laughs> did pretty well. So so you weren't there for you. could You weren't actually there for that. You came after that. That was after. I think that's uh, why they called me up. They're like, we don't need we don't need this guy fighting guys like Gallant anymore. <laughs> yeah, it was it was um, I, it, that was a mistake on my part, by the way, <laughs> that, that, that was bad recognition of who I was tangling up with. And uh I think it was a Sunday playing against Bridgeport. This guy had like hundreds of penalty minutes and, you know, like I, I definitely was not a tough player, Johnny, but Bobby will back me up on this. I was not afraid to drop my gloves if I needed to. I was, I, you know, I was not afraid and I wasn't afraid to lose either. Cause most of the time when my gloves came off, I lost. So it was never as pretty as, as Bobby's. Um, 
But I, I just remember <laughs> my 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 like Bobby gets called up to to our American League team, and if I remember correctly, your first game was in Portland. Is that is that right, Bobby? Am I remembering it? Correctly? That's right. Yeah. And yep. Portland had a bunch of big, stronger, older guys. Like they were a good team, and nobody knew who Bobby was. Like we didn't know know who he was, and he comes in to to a game in our in his first game in the American League with us, and he absolutely buried someone i don't remember who you buried do you remember i, I don't remember I do. who it was <laughs> i mean you, you teed me up there you, chapter I'm gonna, six <laughs> i'm gonna read yeah here yeah, let's let's turn to the chapter um <laughs> a little backstory that was actually ryan hallwig oh um, no way tough guy and wow um we've connected here after our careers and he's he's uh, been rooting for me i got his told him he was in my book and everything and but he plays a, a huge part in my story and Actually, my first, I think I get into it here, but my first year pro, I was watching Hallway when he played for New York. I was in the American League in Binghamton, and I was watching this guy flying around and hitting guys and fighting guys. And uh, he's, he's like the player that I wanted to be. And then he's nails. He, oh, yeah, tough as nails. And then uh, fast forward five, six years later, I'm, I'm called up to the American Hockey League after forever being uh, out of it and feeling like a failure and kind of having a comeback. And now I'm lined up against him. I'm like, oh man, this is the guy I have to fight today. So, uh, you guys want to, has has anybody ever read like literature style on the well, podcast? Look, we're before? gonna put <laughs> we, we're we're putting. I don't know if you can see the screen I or see not, it. Bobby. Yeah. So we you can see it. This is Bobby's book right here: "Sex, Drugs, Pucks, and Souls: The Secret Life of a Hockey Fighter." That picture is so great. Your nose is plugged up. You got the cut on your the bridge. <laughs> um, we're gonna put the link for Bobby's book in our chat on YouTube. Um, so make sure you check that out. And Bobby, if you want to read an excerpt, go, go ahead, man. We'd love to hear it. Cool. I will. But I'll say this, this, this cover here, that was when I broke my nose. That was a nasty one. I, it was against Wilkes-Barre. Um, but our boy, Alan Sullivan, the Providence and Boston Bruins team photographer, who's now passed, um, he took this picture as I was exploding blood from my face. And uh, pretty cool that it just ended up on uh, on the cover of my book because he's a beloved guy in in Providence, especially. And uh, shout out to to Alan Sullivan and and, and his his people. So um, this is from chapter nine called "Becoming a Bruin." This is the backstory is I had given up on my my NHL dream. I was got lost in just the party scene and you know chasing girls and chasing drugs and and you know any form of escape. Um, but I was really fighting a lot of internal demons and battles. And um, one of them was just fear. I think a lot of people have that commonality is uh, facing fear. And mine was a real, a very real fear of literally having to fight uh, grown men, savages like uh, Colby here. Uh, <laughs> I mean, kind of feeling that pressure to do that and to be molded into that player. And I had skipped town. I went to Europe and was just like, screw this. I'm just going to party and, and play hockey. I don't want to fight. Won't give too much away, but I ended up having a comeback. I was like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to fight my way to the NHL. And uh, late in my career, I was almost 30 years old. And then things started happening. I got the call up to Providence. And I was like, man, I'm only one step away now from the dream. And uh, so this is kind of the midway point in the story. Is this podcast rated G or You can say R whatever the fuck X you want. Okay. <laughs> okay. Read, read, it, read it as you would, my friend. I can, I can say an F word if, if need be. <laughs> All right, so uh, chapter nine, Becoming a Bruin. <clears throat> I've been drinking my own urine every morning. Catch it midstream in a pint glass and slurp it down, looking into the mirror and morphing into something raw. I'd heard about some MMA fighters who drink that yellow gold for the healing properties, that magical urea. I picture my cells and muscle fibers growing stronger as I guzzle it down each morning. I bet I'm the only one drinking my own piss. The only one going that extra mile. Plus, I like the taste. The brakes moan beneath the bus. There's no turning back now. We pull into that big barn in Portland, and I see the Pirates players all kicking around a soccer ball in the hall near the entrance. I keep my stare straight ahead and wonder if any of them know who I am. I continue my death stare well into the locker room and prepare just like any other game. Dynamic warm-up, violent visualization, the usual Coach Cassidy calls me into the office and goes over the systems. We're not trying to reinvent the wheel here, he says. You know how to play hockey. Go play good hockey. 
I'm ready to lay everything on the line. Just put me out there, coach. There is this one guy, coach adds, Ryan Hallweg. He knocked our captain out with a concussion, been a real thorn in our side all season. Keep your head up out there. I just nod my head and snarl slightly on the inside, that area right under my neck and above my heart. There's a growling in there that only I can hear. I got him, I say. I flash back to six years ago during my rookie season with the Bigham Senators. My coach asked me what kind of player I thought I was, who I want to model my game after. I see myself as a Ryan Hulweg, I said, a heat-seeking missile. I'd watched him closely during my rookie season when he played for the New York Rangers, and I love the way he plays with reckless abandon, with fire. He's a warrior, laying massive hits and fighting like a madman. He's my favorite player. Today... I'm fighting him. I'm terrified, but ready. Then there he is, lined up against me at the face-off dot during my first shift, first game, first call-up in years. The dialogue runs through my head. I know I should ask him to fight, but when? Now? I don't want to fight my first shift. I don't want to be a one-dimensional goon. I want to show Providence that I can play and be an impact player. When it comes, when it comes time to throw bones at my opponent, then it's time. It will present itself. I bring my gaze to the face-off dot and see the linesman hovering the puck between two eager centermen. Crack! The smooth face of the puck hits square onto the ice and ignites a frenzy of armor-clad warriors chasing that rubber disc of destiny. Then it happens. The exact moment that I turn toward the boards in the neutral zone, Hallweg picks up a suicide pass from his left defenseman. As he lowers his head and turns back to receive the grenade, I drive my body through his, an explosion of fractal geometric patterns of sweat and soul laying him out. The crunching sound of the hit is followed by that collective gasp from the crowd and cheers and boos. He's flying backward through the air and flat onto his ass. And I hear him groan in slow motion. We're going. <laughs> Fight time. It's him. It's Hallweg. His helmets and gloves are off, granite eyes piercing through wild flowing hair and thickets of beard. His fists are up and so are mine. We're squared up and I'm trying not to look him in the eyes. He lunges forward and throws a sweeping left punch. It just misses my face. I hear the sound of it as it moves past my nose. It makes a sort of cracking noise as it pierces through a miniature pocket of the sound barrier and instantly snaps me into game time mode fully focused and 100% present in the moment, ready to put my fist through his face and prove that I belong here in the American Hockey League. We're chucking bombs back and forth now, and one of mine connects hard. My knuckle penetrates his notion of reality, and he crumbles into a heap on the ice. The fight's over. I won. I just sit there in the penalty box and look up at the arena full of screaming fans. I'm back. I skate to the Providence bench after serving my five minutes. Everyone is just looking at me like they don't know what to say or they're, waiting for, or they're waiting for me to say something, something to break the silence, something to officially introduce myself to my new team. I don't know. Something. Anything. Well, fuck that guy, I say. <laughs> my teammates unanimously heave up courage from out of their guts and lungs and yell out a bellowing war cry, knowing that they have an absolute savage on their team who's willing to fight for them. Fuck that guy. From this moment on, I'm a Bruin. You can feel it, like destiny tiptoeing behind me and pretending I don't hear it, but I know it's there. I sense it. So that's that's, uh, uh, yeah, that's the scene. That's <laughs> I mean, when you're when you're reading that, I can visualize <laughs> being in that old rink in Portland. You know, the Portland Pirates. At one point, they were with the Coyotes. At one point, they were with Buffalo. Um, and I mean, man, I can visualize the, the beard, like Hallwig's beard and his oh, yeah. hair. I mean, and, and it's true. He makes Bobby makes this play in this game and we're looking at each other. And he mentioned, we didn't have our captain Trent Whitfield. He was out. Right. And, and yeah. so, you know, Trent played a few hundred games for the Bruins. He's now a coach in the American league, but like we were looking at each other and we had this sort of younger group and we were like, I, I maybe it was Chris Bork who was sitting next to me at the time. And I, was Borky there when you were there? It's yeah. hard. to. And I looked at him and I went, what just happened? <laughs> like we were 
mouth dropped on the ground um, a- after watching you absolutely bury bury him and then fight him. You're right. In that very moment, everybody else on the bench was like, holy shit, this guy is here to stay. Like, you know, a- and um, all- first of all, great writing too, man. Mm. I mean, that that's, that's... Thank like, you, man. You could feel the emotion of that. People are commenting in our chat right now, just like the poetic violence of that. <laughs> I like that. That you just read was even was just, just the sound incredible. of the puck drop. Like you could he- you could like hear it in your head. You know, yeah, crack. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, it, it's, automatopoeia. Uh, that's called. Yeah, <laughs> I mean that that's English that was nerd. such a great moment, Bobby. Like I I remember that moment so well. I bet you not many guys on that those teams that I was on remember a single moment that I had in four years. So. I can vividly remember that moment. Like I can go back to that place and that launched you. Right. I mean, you know, that puts you on a path to your way to the NHL, like that moment right there, because, you know, give, give the, give our audience a timeline from that moment to your first NHL game. And, and also how old were you at the time when this all started, like this moment? Yeah. I mean, that moment when I got called up to Providence, I was 29 so I was pretty late out. That was my, I think, sixth year pro. Um, but I mean, we always look at people's, uh, you know, you always hear like an instant success and people look at success stories and they're like, oh, you know, it must have must have came easy for that guy. But obviously we know that it's the stuff that nobody sees behind the scenes. And man, that that moment there was for me, that was years in the making. That was like really three years of full time fight training and like fighting everyone in the East coast hockey league and just dreaming of being like, man, at that point where I was at, I was like, if I can just get to a call up to the American hockey league, I will have proved it to myself that anything's possible. And then when that happened, it's kind of like, although everything, you know, it's like the stars align and everything just comes together. And literally the first shift that for that to happen, to have an opportunity to, to crush a guy and then to win a fight, you know, and, um, how many times do you hear of guys who got called up or we've experienced it where you try, you try your hardest to make an impact, but nothing's happening out there, you know, but this was just one of those moments where everything just clicked together. And like you said, and like, like uh, you heard in that, in those uh, words there is I felt it. I was like, Oh shit, this is happening. This is the real deal. This is happening. I, and I just felt it. And then, so from that moment on, it was like, they told me to pack for a week, you know? So I had, a duffel bag of clothes and like, Hey, I stay two weeks. And then um, I was staying in the Biltmore hotel in downtown Providence, the haunted Biltmore and just like living in this beautiful room in the American hockey league. And um, got back from practice one day and they're like, Oh, you're my key didn't work. And they said, my, uh, my stay was over. I was like, what? Like I, I hadn't been cut or anything. And so I called Don Sweeney. I'm like, yeah, my what's going on. And he's like, Oh yeah. We, you're still here. It's just like, <laughs> tell them, tell them you still have the room. And so, um, ended up, you know, staying for the whole year and signing a contract for the rest of that year. And then, you know, signing a couple AHL contracts and, um, you know, over the course of the next three or four years, establishing myself in the American league as a player and as a, a guy who can fight as well. And then, uh, yeah, it would be about three years after that before I put on that Bruin sweater. So, so 30, it's, NHL wow. debut at 32 years old, yeah. huh? 32, yeah. Is... It was pretty crazy. Oldest rookie to make an NHL opening day roster. So, I mean, I still felt like I was in my 20s. I was young in my hockey years. I kept my uh, my fitness pretty, pretty uh, good at that point in my career. But, yeah, I mean, I think it just goes to show what, what hard work can do. And um, anybody who's attained that the high level of success knows uh, the formula is just doing the little things every day. And um, I was still at the point in my life where I needed to prove that to myself, where I don't, I didn't know if I really believed it yet. I had, I had talked the talk like everyone does like, Oh, I want to play in the NHL. I want to play in the NHL, but you know, talking it is different than walking it. And especially for a guy like me who was going to have to fight to do it for real. Um, it, it wasn't until I really committed like a hundred percent all in, and started doing all the little things where I started to see the success. And then, you know, all those synchronicities happen and, and uh, things fall into place like that Hallweg fight. I mean, that didn't happen by accident. That was after years of training and hours and dreaming and, and giving it everything I had. 
Well, Bobby, that's something I want to talk about too, because, you know, I, I feel like everyone talks about, you know, working hard and, and that you, you just got to, you know, kind of put your head down, grind, and that's how you get to the NHL. And I think often it gets lost, <clears throat> excuse me, about how tough it is just mentally. And, you know, whether you're a fighter, whether you're a skill guy, power play guy, no matter what role you play on a team, there's a lot of time spent away from the rink when you play pro, when you play college. And, you know, I know for me, like when I wasn't playing well in whatever role I was playing in, I mentally beat myself up. And I think that's a big part of, you know, why I didn't really make it as a player. So for you to play in your first NHL game at 32, I'm sure there were so many you know, mental battles and mental obstacles. And sure, you're working hard physically and you're putting in the time, but how do you train your brain? Because there there are so many good hockey players that I know that just didn't make it because of everything up here. You know, it, it's so hard to per, you know be persistent and, and continue to just believe in yourself. So for you, like when you were away from the rink and, you know, shit wasn't going well, you know, how, how did you overcome that mentally? Yeah, I think, I mean... For me, and I think, like, I think we we resonate in a similar way there. Of, of just, uh, for me, it was belief of I don't know if I ever had that true belief that I could do it. Like I would say it, and I wanted it, but I think with with a belief comes action. And uh, and for me, it was it took me halfway through my career to be able to to get to that point where I was. Um, I call it a good pro. I don't know if you remember that, Colby. What just being a good pro. You know, and that was and Bruce I like Cassidy's favorite line. Oh, just he loved the good pros, man. <laughs> and how you know, coaches Why do. Hated coaches me, love Bobby. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I for I was a guy who didn't. I didn't have the skill that that Colby had, you know. And I was a guy who just had to muck and grind and and give it everything I had every day, and and to be that good pro. Um, but yeah, I mean, once I once I started in that direction of really pursuing a goal and saying, all right, well, here's my goal. It's to get to the NHL. How am I going to get there? Personally, I got to be a guy who fights, you know, 25 times a year. I'm going to make it as that fourth line fighter. And then I was, I just kept breaking it down to, to deeper and deeper levels. Well, all right, how do I do that? Well, I have to become a really good fighter. Well, how do I do that? Well, I'm just going to fight everyone. And so that was my mentality. I was just going to fight everyone. And then I'm going to train harder than anyone. And I'm going to, you know, I'm going to train my body and my mind and my spirit. And so I, for me, it was the whole, um, the whole kind of pursuit of the hockey dream of the hockey ladder was, was uh, for me, it was a pursuit of kind of self-improvement. I didn't know that that was happening yet. And it was all part of my evolution as a man. Uh, But it it taught me a lot of things. And um, it it taught me the biggest thing was just, was the belief factor. Um, you know, once I really believed that it could happen, it was like, you know, I think there is something about, um, you know, believe when, when you want something or you're achieving something, you believe that you already have it. And then you're just taking the steps in that direction to get there. And so, you know, for me, it's, it was breaking it down into those little chunks every single day. And, uh, you know, that's, you know, that's how I was able to write a book too, was taking that same mentality. I think anybody who's looking to achieve anything in business or success or in life, that's that's the formula that I found, and I'm I mean I'm no guru or expert. I'm still figuring it out myself. But you know I found a formula that that brought me hockey success. Now I, I was able to write a book, and it's like all right, there there is something to this about just just believing in the process and and be willing to do that slow grind every single day. Well, I, I can attest yeah. to the fact that look in an American League season, eighty games, a um, lot of three and threes. You know, sometimes when you're an American League team, you're practicing it at some weird little practice rink because the game rink is being shared or used for something else. And I mean, I would avoid going against Bobby in practice at all costs. <laughs> uh, even in warm ups before a game, I didn't like doing the three on twos with him because um, I just was, he, he just, he kept, he, he did everything at 150% effort. You know, and, and it's it's hard. Like, not many guys can go that hard that long. And, and I think you were always willing to go that hard and that long, which is probably why you you wouldn't take no for an answer. I mean, very few guys have the 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 you know for the mental fortitude to be become an NHLer at 32 years old. I mean, it's it's 
like you said, you're the oldest guy to ever make an NHL ro- opening night roster, oldest rookie, right? Like there's a reason yeah. it doesn't happen. It, it, it takes a certain mental. level of, of that mental strength that I think you have. Um, and, and so, you know, just curiously, Bobby, I, I do want to talk to you a little bit about the current NHL and what's going on with fighting right now. It's having a little resurrection. But before I do go there with you, like, Talk a little bit about the process of writing your book. Like what, what, when did that idea come to you and how hard, how long did it take? Um, how do you remember these things? I mean, with the fights and the travel and di- like jo- Johnny asked me, like, how many years did you play with Bobby? And I said, you know, it might've been one, but it could have been three. Cause it just all blends together, especially at the pro level with players moving in and out and, and trades and this and that. So um, it, it really is remarkable what you've been able to do. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah. I mean, I mean, looking back on it, it was, it was a cool experience for me to go back and, and write about my career. Cause there was a lot of healing for me personally that needed to happen. I mean, my career ended on a pretty, uh, negative, I guess I'd call it or, uh, a, a, a sour note for me, just kind of having a injury and then really had a mental collapse and, and entered some pretty dark places. Um, and you know, probably, realistically because of all the impacts I took on my head and because of fighting. Uh, but uh, the, the process for me was, was very therapeutic. I mean, it's, it's called a savage memoir. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a creative writing English major from um, UMass Lowell. Um, so I, as I was playing D1 hockey, I was like, I'm going to be a writer. I, I'm going to write this amazing book someday. I was I was doing it for real, you know, learning uh, creative writing in the process. But at the same time, hockey was always number one. I was like, I'm I'm doing this hockey thing. I'm chasing this dream. I know this will be my story. I just had that instinct. And I think going back to the the faith and belief in yourself is, uh, for me, I've always had this this inner voice or this still small voice or instinct inside of me. And um, for me, it was just listening to that and trusting it. Um, and that was part of my growth as a, as a man and as an athlete. And so I knew I had this book to write and a story to tell. And I knew that it was going to be uh, very impactful. And I wanted to lay it out there like Balls Exposed, a savage memoir. You know, this is a, a deep dive into, it's not just a, a hockey hero story. Like this is, this is sex, drugs, pucks, and souls. Like it's, a, it's those four lenses of, of um of of my life through those four lenses in, in a very deep and raw, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, in a, an emotional way. And so after my career ended, I knew I wanted to write a book. I was like, well, this is next. Hockey's over. I, I'm a writer now. And uh, I was at that point in my life, I was pretty deep in in some drugs. And um, one, I just started kind of, I was like, wanted to be that crazy um, author who's just r- drunk and on drugs and writing. And I did. I wrote a large chunk of it kind of in this haze in a month, um, just blacked out and just had about 100,000 words, which is a pretty big chunk. But it was all <laughs> all some wild stuff. There's a few nuggets. Uh, 100,000 words. Of, no of di- <laughs> there were some diamonds in there, but a lot of it was just the, the drunken ramblings of a crazy ex-hockey fighter, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and but So I sat on that and I, I tried some other things, just was trying to find my stride. I tried some coaching. I coached in Spain for a, the pro team in Spain and um, did, did some things, but I always knew I wanted to say, like, I, I just want to be a writer. I think I'm selling myself short here. And then it was um, right around when COVID hit about four years ago um, where I, I looked at myself in the mirror and said, I've been given this story to tell. I think my story matters. I, you know, this isn't just a, you know, a, a tits and drugs, you know, pussy stories, <laughs> There are there are a lot of those, but it's not that. It's it's more. It's a deep, it's a it's a deep book, and it's going to really, I think, spark a lot of conversations about um, just about sexuality and about what it means to be a, a man and what it means to be an athlete. Um, so I was like, I have this God given talent and this story and this ability to write it. And so about three years ago, I just kind of took those um, I took those lessons I learned in hockey of all right, if I have a big goal, how do I break it down into chunks? And I was like, all right, I just want, I'm going to write this many words a day. And, and it's like, you know, when you, when you eat an elephant, it's one bite at a time. And, you know, it went, all of a sudden one chapter formed. I was like, that's a crazy chapter. That's some wild stuff. And then all of a sudden I had three and I was like, this, this is way too intense. I can't, 
I can't write this book. I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to write a children. So I ended up writing a children's book and I was like, I just want to be a children's book writer. But then I was like, fuck my story matters, man. And, and it ended up just forming chapter by chapter. And then um, over the course of about two years, I uh, had a lot going on in life. I had two boys. I have two sons um, under two. So I was trying to write this book and do it all myself. I started a publishing imprint called Rotterdam Books. We published Savage Memoirs and writing this thing well, all the while re- trying to raise two kids and uh, three kids, so about two under two. And uh, But it just formed little by little. And all of a sudden, one day I looked at it and I was like, it's here. It, it's here. Uh, so yeah, it is here. So this is it. Sex, drugs, pucks, and souls. It's I poured my heart and soul into it. And uh, yeah, I think it's it's definitely something that's gonna it's gonna blow some minds. At what age are you gonna let your kids read it? <laughs> I have a little in the <laughs> in There's the gotta acknowledgments. Be a little fear there, huh? Well, there is for sure. And it, I actually talked about it in the acknowledgments. I'm like, please don't read this book. Honestly, but if you do, I want to be honest with my kids. And and uh, we, you know, I have a 10 year old daughter as well. So she's starting to ask a lot of questions and it's like, when can I read the book? And she knows a little bit about my past and uh, you know, we're trying to, to raise our kids, you know, in a, we, we homeschool our kids and we're, we're trying to raise them in a, a godly way and, and teach them good life lessons. But part of that is like, all right, I'm going to be honest. I was an idiot. Yeah. Like I, I lived a very hard life uh, and I want to, I want to try and teach you guys, but yeah, that's that's definitely been a, an interesting issue to address within myself. I'm like, all right, how much do I say? Do I go all in? And then that was the same thing of facing that fear. That it was the same feeling I felt um, involved with uh, with hockey fighting. I was like, do I do this? Do I go all in? And so I knew that if I if I was to write a book, the story I had, it needed to be a savage memoir. Mm. It wasn't like your 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 feel good, like all right, you know, rah rah rah. Here, I'm gonna fire you up, and you're gonna make it to the NHL. This is not that book. Yeah. This is well, uh, a yeah. savage memoir. So the, the warning on it says this on the first page. It says, uh, warning, mature content, adult themes, graphic sexuality, explicit drug use, crude language, ultraviolence, exploding bodily fluids, general mayhem, and depictions of insanity that some readers may find disturbing. So it's... it's fair <laughs> enough warning. Well, listen, yeah. I, I think... Um... Look, I, I think that uh, first off, you know, when, when talking a little bit about your family, Bobby, you know, it, it's so cool to, to hear you talk about that. And, and knowing you, you know, like I, I did and I do, um, I'm sure you're you're an awesome parent because I've never you don't have it in you to do anything half halfway. Um, so your kids are very lucky. They're probably learning amazing lessons. And 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 I'm sure you guys are doing an awesome job there. But um you know, just going back to some of those years, like that's what we called Bobby the Savage. Like we all played a lot more secure out there knowing we had Bobby by our side. And you know what? I never, and look, I was a 22 year old kid when we met, right? Like you were, you were a hell of a lot more mature than I was. And you had been through the ringer and I had had everything easy to that point. Right. And so I would have never known about any of these internal struggles or anything because you never brought them to the rink. Like we, you smiled, you were happy, you were in a good mood. You wanted to share wisdom with guys, whether you were doing that recovery glove that you used to wear on your hand or, (laughs) or whatever it may be. Like never did you let anybody know around us that like you were dealing with anything. We just knew like, we've got Bobby on our side and Bobby's going to make sure that like we're good out there. And the league was was uh, was dirty and and hard at the time. Like the American League has changed in that regard. It's it's still a rough league, but it's not the jungle like it used to be. It, it it's just not. The game has changed, I think for the better. No, don't get me wrong. I'm not one of these old disgruntled, you know, former players that's like the game's terrible now. I don't believe that at all. I love the speed, I love the skill, but I still love the physicality and the fighting. Um, and, and, you know, just, just thinking about today's NHL, like Bobby, like, where do you sit with it all now? Like you, Matt Rempe has come on to Broadway and stole the show and fights and Revo seems to be reinvigorated with fighting in Toronto. And, and like, how does all that make you feel? Like, where do you, where do you sit and stand with all that? 
Yeah, it's an it's an interesting thing. I mean, I, I don't watch a whole lot of hockey these days. I don't have a lot of time to do that, chasing these kids around. But uh, I do watch, you know, anytime there's hockeyfights.com pops on my feed. Um, shout out to those guys. You know, I, I watch all the hockey fights. I, I always I love watching hockey fights. You know, obviously I did that for a lot of years. And and you're right, there has been a like a resurgence in that, or there's like this, there's this new energy around it with Rempe and and all of a sudden, when McDermott, you know, we we played with with Lane McDermott, now right. his, little, his little brother, who's who's a scary man out there, gets gets traded to the East. You know, you're like, oh, this is happening. You know, this is some tough guys out here, and um, it's it's cool to watch. I mean, there's nothing like a hockey fight. It's it's just like you said, it's like violent poetry in motion, and um, there's something, something deep inside of our, our guts and our soul, I think as men that sees that and is like, he, there's instant respect for it. And there's, I think there's just a ingrained, um, I don't know what it is, a connection to it, that raw animalistic, um, competition. There's something special about it. I love watching it. Um, but at the same time, you know, I know I've gone through my struggles and I know, I know a lot of guys who have taken a lot of shots in the head who are going through struggles too. And so I don't, I don't have that answer. I'm not taking a hard stance on it at this point, but yeah, I mean, we're, we're all men and, and you make that decision. And I think, um, man, for me, you know, I, I hope things end up well for me mentally and, and just physically with my, my brain and everything, but you know, I wouldn't trade anything for the world. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade it. Uh, I, I wouldn't do it any differently. Maybe I would have been a little more defensive in some of my fights, but uh, it's a crazy thing. I mean, why our sports, the one place where you can fight bare knuckles and it's just always been that way. And I don't know. I mean, I, I think, will it always be that way? I don't know. What do you, what do you think? Is, is it going to change? But I think as, as long as it isn't changing and it's still there, it definitely has an impact on the game. Like you said, you know, if I, if I was coming in, with playing on Boston, coming into New York, I'd be like, "Oh crap, man! I'm I'm playing against Rempe, you know, or I'm playing against Revo, and and that for a guy like me who's I'm I'm thinking on the ice, I'm only thinking violence and smashing, mm-hmm. like I'm only thinking four checking, smashing a guy, and then getting in a fight as a fourth mm-hmm. line checker. When when I'm going into play and I'm playing against a, a team that has a guy like Gallant or Rempe or a tough guy a notable tough guy who I'm, who I do feel scared of that affects me for sure. That affects me without a doubt. I'm for me personally, I was either like going to get consumed by the fear or I would take it to the next level and just black out completely and be like, I'm going to be so crazy that I'm just going to make the fight happen for a shift, you know? And so I had to work myself up into a frenzy, but you know, it was like 50, 50, some days it was there, some days it, it wasn't. And I think that that, um, that fighter role still exists for that reason. Everyone feels the fear, even if you're not a guy who's expected to go fight them. Like, you don't want to go back on a puck when, when Rempe is coming to hunt you down. So, I don't know, man. It's a crazy thing. I don't, I don't have, have the answers. It'll be interesting to see how it shakes out, though, over the next you know five years, ten years. Yeah, I, I also found that interesting just hearing you say that it's something that you consciously think about, you know, where your mental health will be later on. And I feel like, you know, that's something that the people who don't like fighting are concerned about for the current players is that they aren't thinking about it when they're, you know, in the midst of everything. And I'm sure when you were playing, it's not something you were thinking about necessarily at the time. So I I think the education though, over the last like 10, 15 years has gotten better. Like, you know, with these Rempe conversations, you hear people saying that they're sitting him down and talking to him and saying, Hey, you don't have to fight every single night right so i think you know the growth of that is certainly gonna help keep fighting in the game right because everyone is so outspoken you know like you and uh you know a guy like carstolo and all these guys who have talked about it you know post careers and whatever um but i I don't want to you know stay on the fighting theme i got one more for you and i know we've kept you so long and, and we're so thankful for your time bobby but i had to reach out to uh you know something i always like to do when we have guests on here try to find someone in common and I got somebody in common with the two of you guys, actually. Jason Berger, a.k.a. Cheese, a uh, good friend Jeez. of mine, reached out to him, and I said, give me something good. I'm Bobby. He said, ask him about the latest scientific American third period edition. So I guess it's something that you used to do in the locker room. You <laughs> talk about like a magazine you were reading or some shit. You got to tell me the story. Yeah, I was a pretty much a psychopath in full hockey gear 
and it was blacked out out of my mind. So I had all these very bizarre things that I did, and Colby can attest to that, I'm sure. But I had these, I think part of it looking back was all these little rituals and things to just to keep me in the zone and keep me outside of that realm of fear that I was existing in. But I had this this tradition um, during the second and third period intermission. I would, at this point, yeah, I was fully blacked out at this point, two periods into the game, and I would just kind of stand up in the locker room and say something like, Hey, I was reading in, uh, and then the, the inside joke was every, every time it'd be a different publication. You know, <laughs> so some days it was, you know, the scientific journal. Some days it was the Rhode Island slut. That's a shout out <laughs> from a uh, dumb and dumber publication. Uh-huh. Um, and I would say, yeah, I was just reading the, the Boston globe that, uh, the P Bruins are a third period team. And I go, ah! <laughs> and, and go nuts, you know, spit some guy- water on the ceiling. The guys would go, the guys would go absolutely. Look, it didn't matter what Bobby did. He had an infectious energy about him. And, you know, look, I I also want to say this to people that are, are, are listening and watching the show right now is like, you weren't look, yes, you're, you were a fighter. You were a tough guy. You were a heavyweight, but you, you could play. You scored goals into division one hockey in hockey East. You were a point guy. You know, Kim Brandevold tells me stories about uh, about your ability as one of the coaches at BU who I've become close with. But look, you also oh, I think Bob, Bobby just dropped out. Uh, we, <laughs> lost, we lost him. But he, he knew how to impact a game, mm-hmm. not just fighting like four checking back checks, good defensive plays. I mean, he really became a spark plug for our team to the point where one year we, we finished first in the American League like we were the the top team going into playoffs and we started our fourth line every game with Bobby on it. He's so back. he's back, but we our fourth <laughs> line with Bobby started a lot of games that year when we were very good. And it wasn't because Bobby would fight opening shift. It was because your line was very, very impactful. It wasn't just fights. Like you found a way to enforce will. And I'm not talking running guys from behind either, but you made players uncomfortable with your presence and the finishing of hits. And, 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 you know, like I was just telling Johnny and everybody, like the year we were really good, your line started what 70% of the games, like our fourth line, you didn't get 25 minutes a night, but you, you're, you're 12 or 13 minutes or whatever. You started every period. You started every game because you guys would set the tone. And, you know, that's where I like the fighting role. Like, I want fighting in hockey, but I want the guys who can play as well. Like, I think Ryan Reeves can play hockey. Whether Whatever people want to say about him, he can play, he can make a pass, he can skate, but he can enforce. And though that's what I like. I like those guys being involved. I played with a guy, David Kochi in Colorado, who was a big fighter, right? He couldn't play hockey. He could not play <laughs> hockey. You know what I mean? Like, Let's let's keep the guys who can throw in the game and just make sure they can they can do the other stuff as well. And I think that's kind of the best of both worlds because those roles are effective. Come playoff time, those guys on the fourth line can make or break a series as as defensemen are thinking about them for checking. There's a reason I didn't like going against you in practice in four checking drills. Right. There's a reason for that. So, you know, it's uh it's important in my opinion and i'm i'm glad it's still around and 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 you know i get annoyed when all these people who aren't playing are the ones worrying about it it's like let the players make their own decisions these are grown adults okay and and you know stop worrying so much about other people let them worry about themselves in this in our society all we do is worry about the next person worry about yourself and your family like like let's let's simplify here so um, anyways, you know, I, 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 that's my rant, Bobby, but, but, uh, it, it's, <laughs> I agree. it's been, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. These, these guys, these guys are when they're grown men. We're grown men and we're, we're fighting for a cause. Like, you know, when I was fighting, I was, I was willing to give it everything I had. I was willing to die for it. There's, there's that, there's that element of fighting inside of hockey. That's, I, I think there's something very heroic about it. Um, and, and, you know, at the end of the day, men make their own decisions and um, and and decide that they're going to do it. I think I think there is some pressure that uh, people get pressured into that role, obviously. But at the end of the day, we're yeah, like you said, we're all grown men, and we we get to make our decisions. And um, 
you know, I don't, uh, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. If you take it out, I mean, this debate's been, it's, it's been had, but I mean, if you take it out of the game, it's, you've seen what, I think it's what less happens. Safe. Yeah, I, I think, think the so game too. becomes yeah. less safe. Yeah. Yeah. There's um, a reason why it exists. We want to thank you again so much and, and just, you know, allow you one more time to plug your book. Where can people find it? Um, we have a lot of people in our live chat saying, oh my God, like I'm getting this book right now. Like this guy's fucking awesome. Um, so you've definitely left a mark here on our listeners for sure this morning, but uh, where can people go buy the book? Cool. Yeah. So this book's only available at bobbyrobbins.com. So go to bobbyrobbins.com and uh, we're doing this all ourselves. Like, you know, I'm taking a note from uh, who are, what are the guys, the duck dynasty guys. Mm-hmm. Where they're they're doing this like they started and and they're they're keeping it all in family. So that's kind of the vision we have uh, with sex, drugs, pucks, and souls. So it's only available at, available at bobbyrobbins.com. I'm literally sending it to you. I think it's as pure as it gets, as uh, as art goes. It's from the the artist, the from the author, right to the reader. Um, and it's it's uh, I captured. Uh, hold on, my mic popped out here. I captured story and my my ass my in the book and um it's it's a savage memoir so proceed caution it's not for kids it's a it's an adult book but uh it's the real deal and um if i actually have a special for your listeners um if you go to bobbyrobbins.com and you put in um if you buy a pre-release right now i have some uh, like signed pre-release and personalized um if you put in the code morning cup of hockey just says it's spelled morning cup of hockey. You can get 50% off a signed and uh, signed and personalized book. So um, give your, your readers uh, yeah. some incentive to head over there and, and check out the savage memoir. And I just appreciate you guys having me on. And I appreciate your, um, your following as well. So um, just uh, if any of you guys out there, give me a follow at Bobby Robbins pro and you can follow along on this process of, of releasing a, a savage memoir that's something that's never been done before. There's nothing like this has ever been written um, in the athletic world. So just uh, buckle up. I'm well, going I, to get I, mine as soon as we hang up here. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm getting one, and I know that uh, I'll be I'll be sitting on the beach this summer reading uh, reading this book, Bobby, and and probably probably like shaking my head like holy shit i remember that and you know i'm sure it'll it'll bring back some great memories so thanks for coming on today man um you know i i i really it, it's great to see you it, it's great to hear you um it, it's fun to to think down memory lane those, those were some 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 interesting years i mean we, we bring up bruce cassidy on the show i mean it's funny running into him these days being in you know doing tv games and we've kind of hugged it out and and love love talk to him now you know uncle bruce and and uh <laughs> i was just in providence last weekend doing the ncaa tournament so you know naturally i had the group text going with with barkowski and and whitfield and and we were talking anton hudobin stories so <laughs> nice. um, it, it's it's great seeing you man good luck with your family and and uh you know with the book and we're, we'll keep talking about the book and keep pumping it and uh you know, like I said, I'm, I'm going to get one right now. I know Johnny's going to get one too. And, uh, yeah. I'm sure I'll, I'm sure I'll be reaching out with some, with some, uh, some comments. I want my, yeah, I love it for sure. For sure. I, love I got, it. I got people in the chat it. asking me if I'm drinking my own piss right now. <laughs> <laughs> You're well, nowhere you near savage enough. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Bobby like, what, can what knock you, me out with you, a flick. <laughs> this is what he thinks in my morning cup of right no, here. Oh, come on. <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> All right, Bobby. Look, Espresso. thanks again, man. We uh Thank we you. really appreciate it. I know we told you like 20 minutes and it's been 45. So, you know, as always, man, ha- have a good one and uh and and be safe out there. All right, pal. Yeah, you guys too. A word on the street is I might be making an appearance at the Frozen Four. Walk in the streets in a Bruins jersey with a, a stack of books like this. Love that. Yeah selling books and, and telling stories on the street. So uh, you know where the to broadcast find me. Booth. <laughs> yeah. You'll know where to find me, Bobby. Yeah, for sure. I, I'm thinking about heading there. If I, if I'm there, I'll come by and say hello to you guys. Yeah. Well, listen, just, uh, just shoot me a text if you come. Okay. I'll be, cool. uh, I'm, da- I'm down between the benches for this weekend, but I'll be around. Oh, so nice. we'll get, we'll get together for sure. Awesome. All right. Awesome. All right. Thanks Bobby. guys. Appreciate it. What a guy, huh? I Holy told you, yeah. I told you, right. Awesome. You like, it's just, you know, like, I, again, I, I know, you know, it's not he's not the big sexy name and this and that. But, man, just an, a, a first class human being, 
you know, I just remember watching him come in. Rarely do guys come from the coast and make that type of mark. And then like he was beloved in the dressing room instantly, like instantly became everybody's favorite guy. Um, and even the guys that were a little scared of him, you know, because honestly, I was a little scared of him mm -hmm. in the beginning. I was like, this guy's nuts, you know, but I'm like, thank God he's on our side. Yeah. And, you know, for me personally, like it's super interesting, too, because, you know, Colby, as you know, a lot of my friends, you know, that I graduated college with, you know, we're 26, 27 years old, still playing in the East Coast League, still, you know, holding on to the dream of one day playing in the NHL. And to hear him, you know, make his NHL debut at 32, it's like, you know, that's why guys are still playing. Right. Like some of my friends call me and ask, like, dude, should Colby, I, I reached out to you. Like, should I go pursue this or, you know, should I hang it up? And sometimes, you know, everyone's reality is a little bit different. You know, I, I wasn't a guy who, you know, I felt like I, I had to get to the NHL. Um, but, you know, there are guys who do believe that in themselves. And it's tough. It's tough to just it's tough to let the game go when you're not ready, you know. And I think for a guy like Bobby, who just, you know, loved it so much and really pursued and, and went through a lot that like you even said, you know, some people have it easier than others. And yeah, uh, listen, I, I, just, everyone's I, story is so crazy. You know, for, first to admit it, you know, when you're a high end draft pick, they hand you everything. And, yeah. and when you're Bobby, they hand you nothing. So um, anyways, look, great, great interview with Bobby. Um, really, really uh, get his book. If you can use the discount code. I just ordered one. Literally, they, they make it so easy with Shopify mm -hmm. now. So I, I literally just. Uh, I just got I just got one on my phone. So make sure you uh, you get on there and uh, and you order a book uh, from Bobby. So. Um, all right. The last thing we got to do today before we go is, is we got to do our Betway bet of the day. Uh, they're our main sponsors. So we got to make sure we give them a little bit of love. Still running a great promotion from Betway. Um, they're going to give you a two hundred dollar free bet up to 200, I should say. So bet what you'd like. If you don't win that bet, you'll get $200 reimbursed into your account. You can do that by signing up for a new account with the QR code on your screen. You follow the prompts, make the account. It'll automatically reload right away. The offer is only available outside of Ontario. Please play responsibly. As always, must be 19 years age or older. Today's Betway bet of the day. We went with Tommy T. Arizona money line plus 125 against the Seattle Kraken. These are garbage time games, Tommy. And yeah, well, I'm going to tell you something. <laughs> hard, hard to handicap garbage time. You know, there's there's not a lot that these teams are playing for right now other than, you know, maybe a little bit of pride and a little bit of, a, you know, trying to stay within the coach's good graces for next year. So uh, we've missed our last couple. Um, I think we went with Jeremiah a couple days in a row and we didn't hit. I thought Vegas was going to hit last night. I was a little surprised they lost that hockey game, especially, you know, with Eichel having a couple of goals. Um, but that's what we got for tonight. We've got Arizona money line plus 125 with all the controversy swirling uh, in the wind around the Arizona Coyotes, maybe soon to be future Utah fill in the blank. We got someone tuning in from Japan right now. Pretty cool. Um, in the chat, just looking at some of the comments in the chat. I got Jeremiah DMing me on Twitter right now, giving me his phone number to pass along to you. So, Kobe, you're going to have to send Jeremiah a text here when we hop off. Or else it's going to be on my head. I um, can do that for sure. <laughs> but great show today, Colby. Thank you for getting Bobby on. Um, that was awesome to hear his story. A little bit, you know, different uh, of our show today. Usually we're kind of yelling at each other, going back and forth. But it's always cool hearing different storytelling and, and whatnot. Um, tomorrow, do you want to, you know, preview a little bit tomorrow? It's going to be a little bit of a, a lighter show, you know, uh, probably like 30 to 40 minute show tomorrow. We went a little bit long today. And then Thursday, we got our Frozen Four preview. So a little bit of a different week here on Morning Cup of Hockey, but a lot of fun stuff, a lot of different stuff, and a lot of games to talk about tonight. So I think a lot we're of good action. Kind of gear, gearing up for the playoffs here. You know, oh, yeah. we're, 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 we're crawling in, but we're, we're gearing up. And for all you that chirp me about being in a preschool room, I will be here again tomorrow. So write your jokes down while you can. You got a, you know, a little less than 24 hours here to chirp me tomorrow in the chat. But um, any final thoughts before we wrap it up? All right. Thank you again for everybody listening. Thanks to our producer, Vic, and we'll see you all tomorrow at 9 a.m.
What's up, hockey fans? If you enjoyed that video, then you need to be hitting the subscribe button right here at Daily Faceoff. Exclusive interviews and analysis from our hockey insider, Frank Zaravalli, fantasy updates from Brock Sagan, and a daily live show at noon Eastern, Monday through Friday. You don't want to miss any of the fantastic content, so hit that subscribe button.